Top Med Talk. Thank you for joining us. We are going to be having the session Cardiac Surgery, ERAS, COVID and Beyond. I am Vicki Morton, your chair for this session. I am a nurse practitioner and the director of clinical and quality outcomes for Providence Anesthesiology Associates in Charlotte, North Carolina. Before we start, I want to introduce our speakers and our panel. First, Michael Grant, cardiac anesthesiologist and intensivist from Johns Hopkins University. Our second presentation will be given by Rakesh Arora, professor and section head of cardiac surgery and cardiac critical care at the University of Manitoba. He has clinical interests in prehabilitation, which he will be speaking on, postoperative delirium and frailty. Our panel tonight will include Amanda Ray, She's the lead advanced practitioner for cardiac surgery at the University of Maryland and St. Joseph. She has more than 15 years of critical care experience and it was instrumental in creating and initiating the ERAS program at her facility and standardizing care for the three-star cardiac surgery program. Our other panelist is Marjan Janari. She is a consultant cardiac surgeon at St. George's University, University of London. She was appointed professor of cardiac surgery at the University of London in 2007, the first female professor of cardiac surgery. And her interests include uh, aortic surgery, including aneurysms, uh, complex surgeries such as Marfan syndrome, things like that. And she subspecializes in pediatric and adult congenital surgery. Additionally, we are having Daniel Engelman join us. He is a professor of surgery at the University of Massachusetts Bay State Medical Center. He is a cardiac surgeon and a perioperative care specialist. He's also the president of our ERAS Cardiac Society. So right now we will hear from Rakesh Aurora talking about prehabilitation and cardiac surgery. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this incredible panel discussion to talk about an area that I'm quite passionate about. I'm going to dive a little deeper into one particular area that is around frailty. What we're seeing are patients getting older and sicker as time goes on. And then we need a more comprehensive approach to these patients that ERAS is exactly the right overlay for these patients to protect them from negative outcomes after heart surgery. I have these particular uh, disclosures that have no direct interaction with this talk other than I will talk briefly about nutrition, but not with any specific product in mind. I will again focus primarily on frailty and allow that perhaps more granular conversation to come through in the panel discussion, but we'll talk about some important concepts for all of us to consider. For those interested in more granular information, Mike's already talked about the guidelines that we put out from the ERAS Cardiac Surgery Society now two years ago. I'll point you to two other important guidelines that are important for our perioperative care of patients, both in the ICU and the ward as it pertains to protecting vulnerability or mitigating the vulnerability in our patients coming through for cardiac surgery. When I'm talking about vulnerability, it's really this slide which I think really drives home this point of why the cardiac surgery patient is perhaps a little different than other surgical specialties when it comes to risk. In our patients, which are getting older and sicker, and I think we've been saying that for the past two decades, but I think now it's in our backyard as the median age of the baby boomers from the, from the Second World War are now over the age of 65. So there's certainly some baseline vulnerability there are patients, and I'll dive into a bit more granular detail what that means, but it's really about frailty, age, social circumstances, psychosocial stressors that all form this, what we'll call a first strike or first component that leads to negative outcomes in our patient, and that's that baseline frailty. The stressors of surgery are also an important component as well that they have to go through pretty extensive surgery, even minimally invasive surgery is a tax on the body. And then what we do for the patients in the post-operative period, as Mike's talked about with opioids, um, mobilization, appropriate uh, sternal closures, chest tube removals, and so forth, as well as all the hemodynamic perturbations that occur in the first 12 to 24 hours can contribute to a third stress or third strike. These combined together can lead to poor post-operative outcomes in our patients. So for the next seven minutes or so, I'll talk about what is frailty, why we need to look for it, and then how we can look to seek to optimize patients through something called prehabilitation. So frailty is really a, a term used for looking at someone's fuel tank, to put it simply, where they have a lack of ability to respond to stressors, be it a, a urinary tract infection, a surgery. And so frailty is really an umbrella term for all the things you see listed on your screen here in terms of sarcopenia, uh, poor nutrition, 
lack of social supports, and so forth. And an intersection of those biological components, as well as psychological, such as cognitive disorders or substance use, and social deficits as well in terms of isolation and other sort of aspects that are lead to social frailty on top of these other components as well. If one looks for frailty in a cardiac surgery patient, about 50% of our patients can be deemed frail. And there are a number of different scoring tools that are out there. And if you look for frailty in any one of these terms, you'll probably find it in a lot of your patients. Why does this matter? So when you look at this particular graph here, it shows two different patients that are starting with different levels of frailty or said differently, different levels of resilience. Resilience is the ability of a patient to bounce back from a stressor. So sort of the, the yin to the yang of the frailty paradigm. So imagine you have two patients that have different starting points, one that has higher levels of frailty or lower levels of resilience indicated by the red bar that you see here and one that has a higher level of resilience or lower levels of frailty shown for you in the green bar. Both patients go through a particular insult or, or stress. We'll say in this case, it's cardiac surgery. And whenever there it is, comes to, uh, a patient comes to hospital for that procedure, there will be a predictable drop in function that we've all seen in our patients that will recover there afterwards. You can see the patient in the green bar at the top there has a relatively small drop in their overall function and rebounds back to their baseline pretty quickly. This would be someone who I would indicate someone with appropriate compensation after a particular illness or stress. Contrast that with the lower line with a patient with higher levels of frailty and indicated by lower level resist of resilience where they had a larger drop in their function below this dotted line that we'll call a functional capacity threshold. Below that threshold, people have varying degrees of loss of independence. That could be simple things in terms of being able to go back to their own home and have to go to a long-term care facility or worse, not be able to do their own activities of daily living, such as grooming and toileting and so forth. In this particular slide here, you can see that second patient has a longer drop from their function or baseline, has a longer recovery, and in fact, never gets past their baseline, and it's just at that functional capacity threshold. That'd be someone with, again, higher levels of frailty, lower levels, of resilience and higher rates of decompensation. What does this mean for the cardiac surgery patient? Well, if you have any degree of frailty, such as that red bar that you see there on the screen, you have a five-fold increased risk of major adverse cardiovascular or cerebral events after cardiac surgery, which would be a negative outcome I think we can all agree on. So how do you mitigate this problem? Well, we've often focused on most of our care in cardiac surgery traditionally in the post-operative phase. I'm going to turn our attention a little bit to the pre-operative phase now and how we can look at patients perhaps a little differently and seek opportunities to optimize them whilst waiting for surgery. What I'm going to talk about in general terms here is something called new prehabilitation or providing an opportunity to optimize your patients looking not just at the exercise component, which is what we a lot of us focus on, but also on nutrition and mental health issues or worry as shown for you in this slide. Again, in, in general topics, what we're showing for you here on this slide is that there is a spectrum of frailty from those being mildly frail to being very severely frail. And that dotted line there again is showing a functional capacity threshold below of which a patient, if they drop below and stay below, will have a loss of functional independence. What the new prehab approach tries to do through a mixture of exercise, appropriate nutrition, lifestyle modification, diabetes optimization, smoking cessation, and dealing with mental health issues as well, is seeking to provide a higher starting point for that patient. So when they have that predictable drop in function after surgery, they're able to rebound back to their baseline or above their baseline with correction of their cardiac disease at an earlier time point. Again, you can see the green bar here in a patient who would have gone through a prehab program versus a patient that did not and had what we'll call standard care. Both have a predictable drop in their function postoperatively, but one obviously fared better than the other, staying well above that functional capacity threshold and in fact got better than their baseline. We'll go into more details on this in the panel discussion of how we actually do this. When we look at how effective this is, again, we have to extrapolate this data from the colorectal surgery patient population largely. There have been some randomized trials in cardiac surgery, but they're relatively small sample size and single center. So there are multiple uh, trials under going, uh, that are underway right now. Based on what we've learned from colorectal surgery patients and other surgical populations and the data that we can see in cardiac surgery, we do believe it's safe to put people through a prehabilitation program that includes, again, exercise and those other things I mentioned in uncorrected cardiac disease. In other words, they're not dropping dead on the track or when they're doing their exercise. It is yet unclear whether we should delay surgery for someone to undergo an optimization prehab. Uh, process, but we'll, we'll, we'll have new studies coming up, hopefully shortly, that will give us some information there.
I'll talk very briefly about nutrition. Again, we can dive into more detail on this in the panel discussion. Nutrition is also an important component of what many frail patients suffer from as well. About one in five patients undergoing cardiac surgery have some degree of malnourishment as defined as an unintentional micronutrient loss or deficit in their overall food spectrum that they intake that leads to, again, worse outcomes, particularly when combined with an overall frail patient coming through for cardiac surgery. Importantly, it doesn't take a long time to help rectify this. Again, extrapolating some of this from colorectal patients, about seven to 10 days preoperatively providing the appropriate nutrition and specifically applying protein calories over total calories seems to be important to mitigating some of the negative effects associated with patients postoperatively. I'm gonna summarize here so we can get into the panel discussion with Mike and everyone else. I think we have to look at patients differently than what we've probably done in the past. Where in the past, a patient would come through a surgeon's office, you look at them, you go, huh, you look fit enough, off you go for cardiac surgery. I think we have to recognize that patients are getting older and sicker and identifying risk and frailty in patients is not as straightforward as using the eyeball test. More comprehensive test has to be done. And if you find someone frailty, we need a more comprehensive plan to manage those patients in the perioperative period of which the ERAS protocol seeks to address. How can we do this better? Well, I think you do the look for frailty. And if you have a patient coming in through the door as an outpatient or they're an inpatient waiting for surgery, we need to look for frailty, alert the team that'll be taking care of this patient perioperatively and look for ways to seek to optimize them during their surgical journey. Preventing it is always better than trying to deal with it afterwards. As you identify people with frailty, finding opportunities to improve them from both an exercise component, nutrition component, and mental health component is important. Lastly, dealing with frailty in these patients is a team sport. All the components here of exercise, nutrition, counseling, really quite requires an interdisciplinary team to participate in that. This is not a one-person, one-stop shop sort of problem. It really involves the entire interdisciplinary team being part of the new prehab process. From there, I'll stop, and thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. I really want to start with the first question, which is kind of the landscape and how it is right now, which is how has our experience with COVID right now been impacting cardiac surgery patients and ERAS, and how important is the movement towards enhanced recovery in cardiac surgery patients in our current environment? And Mike, I want to ask you that first, if you would respond. Yeah, sure. You know, I think this is a topic that's on everybody's minds. And one of the ways to think about this is, gosh, is ERAS even the thing we should be doing right now for in the middle of a pandemic or in various stages of the pandemic? And I think the frank answer to this is that this might be actually the perfect time to think about it. You know, our resources, as we kind of outlined a little bit in the lecture, are being demanded across the board in both directions, all directions. And in some ways, being more enhanced, allowing patients to recover earlier, um, getting those resources where they need to be to make sure those patients are in and out of the hospital for straightforward disease processes is exactly the way that we should be managing them. And in the height of a pandemic, perhaps, this is actually the perfect time to think about um, how you're using those resources and allocating that manpower. And, and enhanced recovery is a really wonderful way to do that. Amanda, hi, welcome. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Do you guys see your census of your cardiac surgery patients increasing or decreasing through all of this? Initially, we were holding on some standard cases or elective cases. Um, so then after we started opening that up a little bit, we were very busy for a long time. Um, and the patients were sicker because they had been waiting for surgery that they probably should have had a few months prior. So I do think w right now we are pretty busy. The other piece that we've noticed is I don't really have data to support it, but it is something we've discussed that we have people who are coming in and are having more difficulty with pulmonary problems people that we didn't really see that or had bad pre-op studies. And we've seen that a little more than before the pandemic. And I'm sure somehow it links, but we just haven't figured that out yet. Yeah, we definitely see that as well. Uh, Marjan, hi, welcome. You're out of London. And I, I, I'd be interested to know how the pandemic has been impacting the cardiac surgery world where you're from right now. I know that you guys um, many times have a, a waiting time for surgery, but are you seeing a shift in that? Are you seeing more of a wait time? Sicker patients like Amanda had um, had suggested that they are seeing. What What is it like for you all? Thank you very much, Vicky and colleagues, for having me before I answer my question. But I would say a combination of everything that you've said. 
Essentially, during COVID, 95% of all cardiac surgical operations in the United Kingdom came to a halt for at least three to five months, which is unthinkable. And one would think what happened to the patients who needed cardiac surgery. To this date, we don't know. Many may have died at home. Many uh, may have had cardiological procedures as a secondary choice, if you like, which let's say ordinarily we wouldn't offer them cardiological procedures even through an MDT process. And I would say another third just had the fear of coming to the hospital because uh, let's say in London, I can speak definitely for London that uh, just now, even to this date, about 20 to 25 percent of all intensive care beds are occupied by COVID. Yes, the patients are much sicker, but I actually, uh, I've forgotten, I compare it to maybe 20 years ago when I used to work with Dan. I don't, I wasn't seeing, let's say, very advanced aortic stenosis affecting the ventricle, not the actual aortic valve disease, let's say, for example. But patients are turning, I can see Rakesh nodding. Our patients are coming with mm -hmm. really hypertrophied ventricles. And then the perioperative management is difficult because let's say the allied health professionals and nurses are not used to filling and filling and filling because these ventricles are stiffer and stiffer. So yes, their management has become difficult. And similarly, as uh, Amanda mentioned, pulmonary uh, complications are common. But there is one thing which I think is personnel related, and that is the risk averse behavior among surgeons. I don't know if that is what our listeners in Ireland or international are experiencing or in the United States, but for sure we have experienced it in the UK. When I say risk averse is uh, if there is a patient who may have been in some secondary contact with COVID, essentially, yes, there is risk averse behavior. One last thing, if I may, there is an inconsistent approach in patients, if you like, who are coming for elective surgery or even urgent surgery. Some are isolating for five days, some are isolating for 10 days, some are not isolating at all. The frequency of preoperative COVID testing varies regionally and even very locally. So I, it, 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 is, it is not, um, it's not uniform, but we've been ex affected a great deal. Yeah, so I, I mean, we can all agree, patients are sicker, patients are waiting, right? I mean, we see it, and even more reason why things like prehabilitation and optimization are so much more important. They've always been important, but even more so now. And so, you know, Rakesh, you're talking about prehabilitation and frailty. Obviously, if the patients are sicker coming in, we're going to see an increase in frailty, and we have to correct that. So. Dan, I want to start with you. As far as your patients and prehabilitation, are you all focusing in on that with your patients currently? Have you? Has it then kind of stopped with COVID? Are you still focusing on prehabilitation? And if so, what areas of prehabilitation are you focusing on? Well, Vicki and team, thank you very much for inviting me. This is an outstanding meeting, and this is in a very astute panel that I'm joining. And I would like to talk uh, about Rakesh's lecture. So first of all, I'd like to point out, you know, listening to this talk, I'd like to congratulate Rakesh on tackling what I would consider the most difficult component of enhanced recovery, and that's the preoperative component, because we are historically intensivists. We like to deal with sick patients and try drugs and interventions and surgeries to fix things quickly. And yet he's moved before the surgery to take patients and try to change their behaviors that have been lifelong and make a difference for the patient. So it's really difficult. I'm sure he'll agree that he has picked an area that if he could do it all again, may not be number one choice. That said, he's really moving the ball forward. And the other part I'd like to point out about uh, his new protocol is the fact that he put in the worry. I don't know if you picked up on that, but it's really looking at the mental health of patients prior to surgery, because I do actually think we can make a difference in outcomes if we can fix patients in regard to the stress before surgery. But at my institution, even though we're being crushed with a fourth wave of COVID, we still are proceeding with all of our prehab efforts. Part of that is because that now patients wait longer for surgery. So 
since they're told they're going to go home for a few months, we say take this as a opportunity then to intervene on them. And the areas that we're looking at most are nutrition, uh, glucose management for the hyperglycemic patients, the diabetics, exercise, so the frail patient trying to get them a, a little bit more mobile. Uh, and the last one um, is really kind of difficult and uh, there's variable ways to attack this, but it's pre-op anemia. What do we do with the patients who are anemic? Because we know they are the most likely to be transfused and that's associated with difficulty. So that's a long answer to a short question. No, thank you for that. I appreciate it. You know, one of the things I always think about is, you know, patients many times when they are scheduled, they say, okay, now I know I need cardiac surgery, whether it's a bypass, you know, aortic valve, mitral, whatever that is. And then we say, okay, now we want you to wait for a little bit and we don't want you to wait in fear. We want you to go home and then we want you to participate in prehabilitation and do all of these things. We've got three great different perspectives here, right? We've got the, the UK perspective, we've got the Canadian perspective and American perspective. So Rakesh, in your institution and you know in your country, is that a challenge? Do people push back on that? Yeah, so that's a really good question. As you quite rightly point out, pre-COVID, we have wait lists in Canada, not dissimilar to what are in the UK, and we have national benchmarks for appropriate waiting time for valve or coronary disease and so forth. And what patients do, as you quite rightly say, are they just sit at home and wait in fear, and they get further deconditioned, they may or may not get good nutrition, and they come to the hospital with their cardiac disease, probably in a worse state than what they were when they were first listed for a procedure. Add now covid on top of that, where they have, have social isolation forced upon them, they don't leave their homes, uh, it can be quite a challenge to then try to deliver the same sort of care to them. So we have two trials we're involved with right now, trying to deliver this home-based exercise, dealing with mental health stress and social isolation virtually as a way to combat some of the realities we're facing now. Because as Amarjan quite rightly pointed out as well, we're seeing patients wait much longer than they have in Canada even for quite some time. They're coming in now with reduced ejection fractions from their ongoing steaming heart disease or valvular disease. Their length of stay in the hospital and the ICU is double what it may have been in the past. And so we have a lot of ring down effect that we're just starting to see the tip of the iceberg for. So to go back to your first question, I don't think ERAS has ever been more important than it is now. It's always been important, but really more important now. And as many of our centers are dealing with wait lists, perhaps for the first time in the U.S., finding ways to interact with patients to ensure that they're protected. If they're getting worse symptoms, we know how to interact with them and escalate their care and provide remote uh, nutrition, prehab, worry, counseling, and so forth. It should really be a focus as we go forward into this next phase of cardiac surgery, hopefully emerging out of COVID at some point in the future. Amanda, are you all focusing on prehab in your institution and are you seeing any you know, pushback from patients and, and instead wanting to go straight to surgery rather than waiting a little bit? So we are focusing on prehab. We actually have been doing bits and pieces of it for a while and um, have developed like an order set and a protocol, which includes the exact same thing Dr. Engelman was discussing. Most patients are open to it. We do get some that are a little concerned, but the people with the high grade disease, for the most part, we're able to still keep in the hospital and operate while they're here for that same stay. So as far as they're agreeable for the most part, is your prehabilitation, it's an elective surgery, cabbage or whatever the surgery is, is it mandatory that the patient goes to prehab or is it the patient's choice as to whether or not they want to participate? We have markers for the different category. So if we use a six second walk test, if it's greater than that, or their albumin is less than three, five, then we initiate nutrition and physical therapy as an outpatient or an inpatient actually, if we have the time. And then for anemia, sort of same thing. We have a benchmark under a hemoglobin of 10, and then we refer you for like an iron transfusion pre-op or heme consult and things of that nature using EPO as an inpatient. That's kind of how we do it. So most patients, they seem to be agreeable with what the physicians want them to do. Some of them are scared about going home, but we do have different types of chaplain services and healing therapies that patients can engage in to kind of help process through that. Marjan, what is going on in the UK as far as your patients with prehabilitation? Are you able to focus in on that with these patients and, and get a, a good bit of them to prehab? With regret, I have to say no. The majority of the patients we're operating on now are urgent. 
what I mean by urgent, probably you have different definitions from the different countries we're coming from, but these are patients who go to the catheter lab or who present to the accident and emergency departments and they cannot go home and they have surgery. So we do, if you like, the most minimum prehab, not uh, prehabilitation in a way that Rakesh and Dan described. So it's just if you like a short-term glucose monitoring and optimizing and a little bit nutrition, but it's short-term. So we regret prehabilitation has taken the back stage just now. It contributes to the longer ICU stay, which is definitely we've noticed. What we've taken advantage of this crisis, perhaps in a good way, because our hospital is being over census now and having to push patients waiting in hospital. Again, like Marjan, probably about 40% of our patients now are waiting in hospital for surgery, which is new for us, that we've pulled them across to our post-operative ward in the pre-operative phase. And so then we have a dedicated walking protocol for them that they have a biofeedback marker on their wall and they can see how much they've walked every day and increasing it along with providing nutrition for that week or 10 days whilst waiting for surgery. So taking advantage of this a necessity, we've kind of used it to find a way to provide some optimization whilst they're waiting in hospital. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, the urgent patients, for sure. I mean, we can do so much just to, you know, in that short bit of time to optimize them. Um, what you were talking about, Rakesh, but even, you know, anemia optimization, there's some studies out there showing short duration anemia optimization prior to surgery as short as really three days, providing a benefit to these patients. And I think that any little bit that we can do is so helpful. Mike, in your hospital, as far as, you know, the, the prehabilitation piece, whether it's the urgent patients or elective, are you, you know, really focusing in on that? And, and are the patients pretty agreeable to, to participating in your institution? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, one of the things I'll point out, and Rakesh kind of alluded to it, is that if you have an inpatient, um, an, an urgent patient, they're they're at your disposal and more or less your beck and call for, you know, three to five to seven days waiting for, you know, antiplatelet agents to wash out or um, for there to be OR availability. And so that's really an opportunity. So I love that he's kind of signaled that. And Vicki, you mentioned that, you know, we don't need very much time to optimize somebody, particularly for um, hemoglobin optimization. You know, I, I mentioned the study, the ultra, ultra rapid optimization study, um, where you can give three of these various agents all kind of in block the night before surgery and you actually see an impact. So, you know, a lot of these things, thinking creatively a little bit outside the box, you can actually imagine a way to get these patients optimized in a pretty rapid fashion. And you might be surprised at just what the return on that investment will be. And to Marjan's point, these patients are not just sicker, but they're taking up a ton of resources post-operatively as a result of being sicker. And this is really a way for you to leverage that preoperative stay to reduce your length of stay overall. Mike, one thing that you had published on was the use of erythropoietin and optimization for the cardiac surgery patient. I know in my institution, we've gotten a lot of pushback um, and we've not been allowed to use that, you know, just the risk of cardiovascular events. But we know that, you know, that's erythropoietin in large doses for a longer period of time, not, you know, just a, a short use of EPO. But tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I may, I may even broaden the dialogue just a little bit. You know, EPO is certainly, it's a four-letter word in some institutions, and I'll recognize that that's a reality. And it may be very possible that we'll never have a study that's large enough to really talk about some of the potential risks associated with its use. But that should probably tell you that its use is probably less risky than we think. So that's the first statement. But the second statement is all of the strategies that we might employ for, say, a Jehovah's Witness, why are we not simply expanding those strategies to all comers who are undergoing cardiac surgery? And what I find really compelling is that there's actually some of mm -hmm. these various interventions that we could apply across the board, smaller test tubes, spacing out laboratories, more strategic use of our iron supplementation, things that are really inexpensive, but frankly are systematic that we could apply to each one of our patients. And boy, would you get an amazing return on your investment by reducing transfusion rates and having less side effects associated with a whole host of other things that we're doing during the course of their stay. It actually comes down to the surgeon also treating the patient different, even in the operating room, because surgeons know that if they operate on a Jehovah's Witness patient, you can't come up wet. And if you start bleeding at all, you're right back in the operating room. And we know that every transfused um, unit of blood increases short and long-term morbidity and mortality, no matter how you look at it in every multivariate analysis. So blood is bad. So you're correct. 
we should figure out how to treat every patient as if they're a Jehovah's Witness patient who would permit a unit of blood if push came to shove. That's sort of the new, that should be the new um, mindset. That's my thought on that regard. Well, and I think along with that, you know, the optimization is a benefit for sure. I think that mindset of the provider is also needs to be addressed. In my institution, we have implemented a, an anemia optimization protocol for our elective surgeries, and actually now, most recently, our urgent surgeries. And we have really shifted our transfusion rates and, you know, statistically significant improvement in that. But what I found is looking at, at all these charts that we still have providers that are looking at, you know, just, it could be a hemoglobin of whatever, let's just say nine, let's just say that, and they're transfusing or a patient with a hemoglobin of seven and a half and not transfusion, it's all over the place. And we really had to kind of pull them together and identify some transfusion triggers because we're optimizing these patients and they are doing better, but we had to change the mindset of people that were actually treating these patients post-operatively. Do you guys find that at all in your practice? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a big bugaboo for a lot of places. And, you know, there's, there's, you know, as I outlined a little bit in the lecture, there's a three-pronged approach. You can optimize ahead of time, you can change your transfusion triggers, and then you can have all of the strategies in the operating room to kind of reduce the bleeding rates. All that's true, but none of it's going to make any difference unless you have everybody with a similar mindset across your service line. And so one of the ways to potentially think about that is we created a dashboard that has every provider in the service line identified by name. You can actually go in and look specifically at individual providers' transfusion rates. It's kind of a fun way to jab at each other a little bit. And we obviously all care about each other. And we, you know, this is kind of the transparency that we've accepted in our institution. Everybody's a little bit different in that regard, but it's a wonderful way for us to understand where we are at a given time and know what our transfusion triggers look like. We can see when that occurred for each individual and then across the service line in general. And it's really nice ticker for us to use for our quality assurance. I love that approach. <laughs> so Vicki, just stepping back a few minutes, we were talking about how patients are in the hospital, they're waiting for surgery, they're kind of trapped, and we can use that time to potentially prehabilitate them. But at least in the US, now correct me if I'm wrong, Amanda, Vicki, people who are advanced practitioners and they're taking care of our patients, we as a cardiac surgical team are not responsible for the preoperative patients. They're on a cardiology or hospitalist service. They're not on our service. Hence, we tend to not pay them as much attention. So how do you handle that, Rakesh? Are you bringing them onto your service in order to intervene and so, do all those things you're talking about? We have been. And again, I'd like to say I was smart enough to think of it proactively, but it was sort of a process that got enacted in our hospital due to resources that patients were coming across to us preoperatively. So those patients, we sometimes have about 20, 25% of our, our census on our postoperative ward that are preoperative patients waiting for in-house procedures, valve cabbage or what have you. Um, so we started the process in our own home first. So we knew how we'd run and how we're, and what were the, the, the barriers uh, for success through the PDSA cycle. Once we get back to a normal workforce and stable uh, platform for cardiology again, that, that we would start doing this on the cardiology wards preoperatively. So it comes down to awareness. I think that was one of the key things that Mike said in his talk. It's about awareness of the process, be it about prehab, about anemia treatment, about post-operative transfusion triggers and have it in going down the entire service line. So it becomes your mantra of, of your group. You know, anyone along that way can decide they're gonna give a blood transfusion that will completely upset that particular provider's upper cart without understanding why they're doing it. They're saying, well, I think we should do this based on they seem to be a little short of breath or what have you. We'll give them blood because they're 80 years old. And we've learned recently that's not the case, but not the whole team may not know that. And particularly as a lot of our teams turned over and will continue to turn over at a higher rate now post COVID, that awareness of the various components that are important will become even more important to ensure it's widely disseminated. Amanda, how is it in your institution if you have patients that are pre-admitted? Whose service are they uh, on? Most of the time, our service most of the time where we manage them. It helps keep things from happening that we don't want to happen, like blood transfusions or getting put on Lovenox or things like that. So most often the patients are on our service and then we consult out for any medical needs. 
Yeah, that's how it is with us, too. I mean, I'm with anesthesia, but it, they are on the, the cardiac surgery service, although on the anesthesia side, we also go and, and see those patients daily as well and very involved in the optimization of those patients. So, yeah, Dan, I, maybe uh, you need to shift your, your service a little bit. Vicki, doesn't this highlight, I think, one of the really interesting pieces about all this is that everybody's system is dramatically different. Yeah. I mean, the fact that you're incorporating various localities, you're, you're, you have different disciplines involved. Some of us have AP models. Some of us have decided that we're going to have resident models, or maybe there's a mixture of all of that. And gosh, is there some complication to this? And we've just described three different, very, very different um, environments and they're not just based on being, you know, domestic United States or, or, or outside the United States. So, you know, all of this has to be taken into account when you're thinking about how you're developing this system. I want to talk about nutrition. We've had a couple of sessions on nutrition at this conference already, but nothing really specific to cardiac surgery. So I want to find out, Rakesh, nutrition wise, I know that, you know, you have a great interest in this topic and how do you... Uh, I guess best optimize your patients nutritionally, whether they're elective surgeries, urgent surgeries, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? So I think the first thing that I heard Amanda is that you need to measure it. You got to measure what their baseline nutrition status is and know what your starting point is. And then providing the appropriate supplementation preoperatively. And I think probably all patients can benefit from some improvement, particularly around protein, because it's just a huge tax the body takes on your skeletal muscle stores post-operatively for wound healing and everything else that's involved. So everyone will have a pretty rapid deficit post-operatively. So by providing those pre-operative nutrition supplementations at a higher rate than you probably usually traditionally used to, so 1.5, two grams per kilogram pre-operatively, we think in the older adult that a leucine-rich protein product is probably a little better at preventing sarcopenia. So we've tried to we're currently looking at a trial, looking at one particular type of product like that to see if it makes a difference in mitigating it. And it has to continue through the post-operative phase as well. So in the early post-operative phase, they have all the issues of nausea and vomiting and, um, and, and bowel issues secondary to narcotics. So again, adopting all the various components of ERAS help improve nutrition post-operatively is as important as well. We've learned upon discharge that patients go home and they have no idea what to do. Uh, so we're now trying to find a process developing a discharge plan for patients so they know this is how you go shop, this is what to look for in labels, this is what you want to target on a per day basis as well. And that will be a remote service that we're trying to do, again, leveraging what we've learned through the virtual clinics over this past year. Do you all use a specific screening tool, a pre-op screening tool? We use the mini nutritional assessment, or MNA is what we use here as a baseline screen. If we find something that's abnormal or if their pre-op albumin is low, which is not a great surrogate for nutrition, but it's a better than nothing. We find those then we'll go to a more detailed assessment there afterwards. Amanda, can you talk to me about what you all do at your facility? We're just starting it, but we have decided to just use a albumin of less than 3.5, knowing that that's not the perfect marker, but that there's not a lot of downside to getting nutrition free up. So we're trying not to add more things to the staff in screening than we have or things that maybe have a more of an importance to add later. So we were just trying to minimize that, and that was why we chose the albumin. Arjan, I know you said that the majority of your cases are urgent cases um, right now, but even with that, the patients being in the hospital and kind of a, they have to listen to you, right? Like, you know, you've got them right there in front of you. What are you all doing as far as their nutrition optimization? Are you screening them? Are you consulting dietary? How are you approaching that? We involve our, first of all, we try, and uh, you referred to it earlier as some of our panel members, we'll get them out of the cardiology ward. Not that they won't receive good care, but they're a bit more directly on the cardiac surgery, if possible, if feds allow. And just, I would say sometimes uh, they all have a dietary advice with some protein shakes and different sort of dietary supplements. But again, it's short term and I'd be very interested to see what is the very short, you know, for this short period, whether we genuinely make a difference. Probably we do, but I'm not sure. Dan, I know you guys are doing some optimization in the nutrition area with your patients as well. And I believe I've even talked to Cheryl, your clinical nurse specialist and have made actually some improvements. Can you talk to me a little bit about what you're doing? Yeah, so we have no beds. 
cutting right to the chase. There are no beds. Nobody's in the hospital waiting for surgery because we have no beds. If they're in, sick enough to be in the hospital, they're going the next day. That's where we're at right now. We're so overwhelmed with COVID. So everybody's home and we're sending them home with shakes. That's the big thing we figured out. We got the shakes. Uh, the hospital was willing to actually just purchase them at a real steep discount and give them to patients. They took that on because when we tried to send them out to a pharmacy to buy them, it just never happened. So we, at the first consult, we'll hand them a, a bunch of them and send them home with them. And then we encourage them to take them. And we, you know, use the same screening tools that Amanda and uh, Rakesh discussed. And then we try to actually prove that we've made a difference. And as uh, Marjan talks about, you know, a couple days probably is not going to make as much of a difference. But these patients aren't waiting a couple days now. They're waiting weeks to months. So right. we feel like there's some mm-hmm. time to actually make a difference. We have a question from um, the audience. And so the first one is any suggestions for prehabilitation, specifically nutrition and support for low income countries and where the strategies wow. for enhanced recovery are very difficult to implement? What a great question. I don't think I've ever thought about that. Um, yeah. So I guess at the end of the day, the, if you have to give calories preoperatively, protein sources are probably the best in whatever form that looks like. Probably the access to that is relatively cheap in most circumstances. It doesn't matter how you prepare it; will be part of the trick, I guess. And 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 trying to consume that for the period of time prior to surgery, from a nutrition standpoint, in itself, is probably a way to start. Um, pr- certainly, when you combine it with any degree of exercise, it's sort of like two plus two equals five. There's an added benefit of doing both together. Uh, either one in isolation is better than doing nothing. But if you can combine the two, uh, it's probably a better bang for your buck. So the exercise the, component does not be no, complex. Yeah. But beyond the nutrition ahead, component sir. for for the third world nations, we should really focus on such things that might be easier and cheaper, such as smoking cessation, hazardous alcohol use. I mean, there's much less cost to these things. And there is, in some nations, a much higher incidence of smoking than there is in North America right now. So that would be very helpful. And then you have the exercise. Anemia, maybe it's just iron deficiency anemia if we're talking about the third world. I don't think we have enough data, but there's a huge amount of work that can be done there. I mean, this is the majority of the world. Yeah, and I think when it comes to nutrition, and and this question was actually asked by Maria out of uh, Macedonia. When it comes to nutrition, many times it's just simply educating the patients and what is the right thing to eat and and sitting down and talking to somebody Mm -hmm. and mapping that out and how do you read a label and what do you need to do? So kind of self-optimization nutritionally, and teaching them how to eat better and preparing themselves for surgery. So that might be a... So if I could just make one other suggestion as I'm thinking about this in real time, is that what we've learned here, at least from our postdoc fellow, Anna Hudik, who's been really engaged in this, uh, it's not to be well said, but she does a lot of patient engagement panels. So leveraging patients who have either been through surgery or are going through surgery to help design what your your program may look like and it's specifically around nutrition uh that often could be a share a, a relatively low cost shared resource to um help one another uh with some guidance from medical professionals and you probably learn things from them that you hadn't thought of clearly that i've not thought about this topic as all at all as an example uh, they can often inform you what works and what doesn't work from their perspective That's a great point thank you very much rakesh i really want to touch on opioid consumption and multimodal analgesia. Um, And I want to know what y'all are doing to minimize opioid consumption in these patients, improve pain scores, minimize the need for, you know, prescriptions going home or long-term prescriptions, as we know. And and Mike, you said it in your talk that there is a a percentage of patients that go on to be persistent users that are opioid naive coming into cardiac surgery, which we really need to try to impact that. So Marjan, what are you all doing from a multimodal perspective? I think discharging patients home on opioid, uh, particularly from the publicity from the United States, that has decreased significantly. I can't give you figures, but there are very few patients who go home on, if you like, even the weakest uh, form of uh, medication on discharge opioid. However, the perioperative care, particularly on intensive care, and the first 24 to 48 hours, there's still some patient control analgesia, which has significant amount of opioid. And um, I think we're trying to get across to our intensivists and uh, some anesthetist colleagues, but it's getting through, but not as fast as uh, the medication uh, at discharge has got through. 
So I don't know if that's the experience of other colleagues, but uh, their use is still prevalent, I would say, in the first 24 to 48 hours. And it could be less, definitely. And I see patients, like actually, I operated on a very nice American lady a few days ago, and uh, she had major aortic surgery. And then um, she's she was extremely well read. And she said, look, I'm feeling unwell, but I think they've given me a lot of opioid in intensive care. Mike, as a cardiac anesthesiologist, would it think that you guys are really focusing in on a lot of regional anesthesia to help reduce the need for opioids postoperatively? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, I think the opioid burden starts in the operating room. You know, we often think of opioids as being kind of that cornerstone of cardiac anesthesia. They're incredibly hemodynamically stable. Um, but what I think we've overlooked is that it contributes Tributes maybe even kind of starts lights the the initial fire as to using opioids long term. There are issues with things like hyperalgesia um, that are a direct result that you can have rapid escalation of opioids just simply because we use relatively short acting forms of the agents. Um, and I think these can have not just um, impacts in the initial postoperative course, as Marjan well said, but um, certainly when they go for discharge. And there's a really nice publication this last year that basically said that if you look at the opioid requirements just a day or two prior to discharge and you prescribe simply a seven-day supply of those opioids, that patients will essentially not require opioids long-term. And it's a really effective strategy to think about opioid reduction. And the last thing I'll say is that regional analgesia is a cornerstone of this. It's a cornerstone of all enhanced recovery. It doesn't have to be done in any particular form. There are lots of ways for this to be done, I think, in a really appropriate fashion. Um, but it requires some in-servicing and it requires a skill set that you have to teach your providers in many cases. And um, although that um, isn't insurmountable, it's logistically a challenge. And so there's a lot of work that needs to go into this area before we can say it's a slam dunk for all um, individual centers. But Vicky, I'd like to push back slightly. So I, I congratulate Mike on being a leader in the world in pointing out the dangers of persistent opioid use uh, and um, all of the things we can do to mitigate that. But I would take it back one step further. You, most people think it starts in the perioperative time frame and, and upon discharge and how much you give them in the unit. And you're now bringing it back to the operating room with the dangers of opioid-induced hyperanalgesia. But I would take it back even further to the preoperative education where I think we can significantly decrease the amount of opioids patients recover by educating them up front that yes you will have pain it needs to be tolerable and we're going to take care of it with multimodal analgesics that I think is really where it needs to start. I absolutely agree with that Dan I think that um, educating those patients on exactly what you said is really for enhanced recovery, for opioid reduction is the key, um, is making the patient a partner in their own care and educating them, making them aware as to what it is our approach is, bring them along and, and help them better understand. Completely agree with that. We only have a, a couple minutes. Um, I want to ask the last question. The question is, if you can't do any pre-op optimization, is there still value in the elements of intra-op and post-op enhanced recovery? Dan? Absolutely. I mean, my short answer is, Standardizing evidence-based best practice is the goal here. With a lot of this stuff, there is a better way of doing things. I'm not always sure which the best way is, but we have so much variability in how we take care of our patients postoperatively. We need to study the literature, figure out what's best, and standardize that care because that's best for the patients. It makes it much easier for the advanced practitioners to get the patients out uh, safely uh, and quickly. Mike. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love uh, standardization for standardization's sake, but I, I'll go even a step further. There are multiple um, studies out of our own institution that have basically said that if you can only employ one phase of care, and that's the operating room, that you're going to get return on that investment. Um, and that obviously can extend to a, a host of other, other phases of care. So the answer is definitively yes. Great cash. I think, I think they both said it very well. I think decreasing variability amongst your practitioners and your team and engaging patients and caregivers up front really sets the stage for what the overall trajectory that patient will look like and disseminating that down the entire uh, service line with a single-minded goal that you're trying to enhance recovery, get them back to what they're doing as quickly as possible. Amanda. I'd say definitely yes. Um, and I think actually it's a great place to start uh, in the post-operative or intraoperative period. If you're starting at ERA, 
protocol or program, it's the perfect place to start. And Marjan? Definitely, yes. I support all my colleagues, but if there's a lot of variability in any unit, including ours, I think post-operative is easier than operative. And I agree with everybody. Any elements of enhanced recovery that you can implement for your patients is going to be of benefit. If you cannot optimize them right away, that's fine. Start somewhere. Um, you guys were out of time, and I so appreciate all of you being here with us tonight, uh, this afternoon, back uh, back home in the States, and um, appreciate all of your expertise and, and advice for our, um, our viewers tonight. So thank you very much. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.